about that again. Okay, so let's talk about ideas for open house and the first days. And it seems by the responses that most people in here haven't had the open house yet. My open house is gonna be on Tuesday of this week, which is gonna be August 1st. So today our agenda is I'm gonna share some practical open house ideas that have worked for me. I'm going to share some ideas for the first days and I'm going to, um, well, that was part of the first thing, plan for open house without stress and then be proactive with classroom management. Uh, and our overall goal is to make our back to school routine effective and stress-free. So when I was talking about how I didn't have much time over the summer because my energy was focused on something else, I was happy to find out that on Thursday night, my colleagues, I have a group chat with colleagues. Does everybody else in here have a group chat with colleagues? <laughs> Like it doesn't have to be language teachers, but you have your people maybe. So my group chat consists on my other language uh, teacher friend uh, and then about three math teachers and two ELA teachers. So we have a little group chat and it's like our social emotional learning on the side, right? Uh, so they were blowing up my phone on Thursday and I was kind of like following the conversation and they were talking about, oh, do you see the email for tomorrow, this, that, and the other? And I was not worried. I was not worried at all. In fact, I said, I'm going to check that email tomorrow. So when I got to school, I found myself pretty calm. And that's really great. And the reason why I found myself really calm is because I have a routine that works for me. I already know what I'm going to do. And as far as open house and as far as... um just teaching in general for the first two weeks or so. So um, let's start with like ideas for open house. I will be sharing this uh, presentation with you. I'll actually email you the link because I haven't downloaded it and created a special link for it. But ideas for open house that I have that have worked for me throughout the year. And I'm not telling you, you have to go do this right now. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Okay, I have, um, I have several things that I do and it might be, uh, I use Canva primarily. So I don't know if this has ever happened to you in your school, but in my school, or photocopiers are the worst. They have the worst reputation. And I don't know if you have ever experienced being back at school and the photocopiers are not working. So how do you print the syllabus? How do you print all these things that need to go to parents and all of that? And then we also went through COVID, right? When we really did not want to be passing out all these papers and whatnot. So from COVID, I kind of just um, changed several things. So one of the things that I did is I made business cards and I used Canva to make my business cards. And I, I honestly, when I bought them um, a couple of years ago, I bought so many of them that I still have, I've been using them for a while. So, uh, and I give them to my parents and my students. And I have um, all my information, my extension number, my email, when my tutorials are, that never changes. And then on the back, I have my little website that I created. And I'm not telling you to go create a website. It could be something as simple as a, as a Canva document. And I don't know if you know, but if you create something on Canva, um, Canva for education, you can tell it to make it a website. Do you know that? Yes? So you can create a document in Canva and, and everybody understands what I mean by Canva, right? Okay, so it's free for educators. So you can go to Canva and you can work on any document, make it pretty or whatever, or don't make it pretty. And then you can turn that into a website. But if you wanna make it even simpler and you don't wanna take the time to create a full website, which is fine, because that's what I did initially. I was not making a full blown website. Uh, you can go to Google Slides and get one slide with all your links of all the things that you want to share with parents and or digital forms or whatever. And you know you can get the link and then you can turn that into a tiny URL, right? We know how to do that. So that's the way that I save so much paper and I don't have to stress out if the photocopier is going to comply or not. And I actually like it better. And what I have found is that when parents come to the open house, I do still print a couple of documents, but they rather not. They rather not, especially high school parents, because they get so many papers and they really love just taking my business card and everything's gonna be on the website. 
And this year, um, well, second semester of last year, I tried something else that I'm going to share with you too. But that is one way I have simplified this. So like I said, when I first printed these out, it was cheaper to print out like 500 of them. So I still have these. All I got to do is pull them out and make sure that my website is updated, which it isn't yet, but it will be by Tuesday. Okay, so let me just share with you what is on my website. And again, you don't have to make a website. You could just do a slideshow with the links. But in my website, if my, par if my parents are Spanish to parents, I have my syllabus in there. And then I have um, how they can access it. And then I have other things about um, if they want to watch some certain videos about grades, about, you know, Google Classroom and things that I use in the classroom, uh, they can watch that. But it's a very plain website, honestly, like there's nothing magical about this. And um, and if my parents are Spanish three parents, then, you know, they have the same info, but for Spanish three and, and that's it. And then if they go home, they have my schedule. And this was from last year. Remember, I have not updated this. Uh, and then they have how to get in touch with me, which is important, right? And uh, and all of that. So that's pretty much, it's, it's simple. Again, websites can be time consuming, but this particular one is not given to me by the school. I went to Wibbly and I'm, I didn't pay a dime. It's free on Wibbly. So you can just do the website free if you want to. But again, you don't have to. You could just create a slideshow that will have the same essentials and it's no big deal. And parents will be so grateful to not have to take two or three pieces of paper home. And you will be so grateful to not waste so much paper that's gonna end up in the trash. Unless something needs a signature. If, if you know your admin wants specific things signed or you wanna you know, cover your butt for very specific things, then yes, print have that printed. But that kind of stuff normally, I don't have it on open house. I normally give it to students during the first week back. Like if, for example, photo and video release kind of things for my own purposes, I send that home with my students separately. And, uh, and yes, so those are two ideas that make for me, like all I have to do now, because I already put in the work in past years to build this website, it's gonna take me about maybe 15 to 20 minutes to change the things I need to change for this year. And I'm, I don't have to, you know, go fight with the photocopier. And some, like, wait, I don't know about your school and what they want you to have an open house. I know in some schools, they have everybody in the cafeteria and they have them set up tables. And, you know, this, every, they send everybody to the cafeteria to kind of tour around the tables and meet all the teachers. In some schools, I know that you are in your room and the kids come and the parents come to your room and then you talk to the parents and whatnot. Whatever the scenario may be, this is what I normally have. I don't like necessarily go all out. Um, but over the years, I've learned that I take pictures. I take pictures every year. And at the end, I just create a slideshow. And in fact, you know how those last weeks of school, there's students who are bored in other classes. So normally in the last weeks of schools, I print pictures and I have student volunteers make like a scrapbook or put together like a trifold board with all of those pictures. And that way I have that ready for the open house next year. So if you, obviously, you know, I, I, I don't want you to go and say, oh, I have to have this this year, but this is an idea that you can use for next time for your open house. Uh, something else that I include on my table or that I have handy are books or readers that I'm going to use in the classroom. So I am not required to use any specific textbook. I use readers and, and I have that. Uh, so I have the readers that I'm going to use for uh, level two, for level three, and I will tell parents about it. And, I, you know, I just have them in there so that parents can see them. And also... I do have, like I said, a trifle with pictures and my trifle, it is a little bit fancy. The school provided it for me. And uh, and you can see a video in here of what that trifle looks like. And in fact, I'm gonna share that with you very quickly because it's a very short video. We're not gonna watch a short video, but I want you to visually see 
what that looks like. There's one simple hearing I'm hack anyone can use to improve their hearing almost overnight. Today, I am gonna share with you one of my favorite, favorite hacks for Meet the Teacher Night. I really don't prepare much for Meet the Teacher Night. I have stuff that I have recycled over the years. All I need is a signing sheet. All I need is maybe my Amazon list so that parents are invited to contribute to my needs for the classroom. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in another video. Okay, so, but you see the trifold, right? So that is the trifold. And then I have my uh, friend who also teaches Spanish at my school. And we have pictures of just our students in class, everyday class or special days or special things that we did. And it's, it's, it's there. Like we didn't change a thing. We didn't, we didn't add any more pictures. We I, I added a few last at the end of last year, but you know, not much. And then, you know, and maybe in four years, we're going to realize, oh, all of these kids are gone. So we need to make sure we, we get some newer pictures, but that that's what I mean by um, a trifle. And that way I, I have it, it's all ready. And, you know, pictures, you know how what they say, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. So when you have this for parents, the students can see that your class is going to be active and they're going to uh, appreciate that. Something else that you could have could be, but you could add that to your links as well um, to explain to the parents um, about how you teach your class. If you teach it uh, with comprehensible input or if, or however it is that you decide to teach the class, you can make a video just for parents. And, and that's always useful. As a matter of fact, this week, a parent reached out, students don't start until Thursday, and a parent reached out to ask, and she said her child hadn't done very well in Spanish one, and they booked him for Spanish two second semester of this year. And she said, "What is? how do you teach the class? Is he gonna have issues in your class? Just a concerned parent. And I sent, I replied to her email and I sent her the video I did for, that I used to welcome my parents. And I'm gonna add it in here because I don't have it in here. Uh, it is it is a, a long video, I need to make it shorter. It's about 17 minutes. So I don't think parents watch it fully. However, it's a video where I explain how I teach my classes and how parents can help my students be successful. And through the, I, I, I got a reply to her message and I said, you can watch the video, this video if you would like. I go in full detail of how I teach my classes, why, and how you can support your child. Um, and, and yeah, so that was great. She replied, she was very grateful. And, you know, she was, she told me her, her words. She's like, I'm, I feel at ease. So, you know, that's great. So I think it's helpful to have those videos. And again, we know. I don't know, it depends on the school that you work at and you know what type of school you work at. It's all different for everybody. But I know in my case, maybe the 25% of the people are going to watch my video, but I'm still going to make it. I'm still going to make it because I wanna have it if I ever need it. And even if only 25% of the parents who watch the video, it's worth it. And yes, so the other thing that I'm using this year that I started using second semester last year, is um I have my digital business card and I uh, use this thing called Popple. It's got a freemium version, so it's free to sign up for. And basically what I love about Popple is that all I have to do is, uh, is put this QR code for parents. And if somebody comes in, they can take my business card. So they have my information that way. But if they scan this code, it actually uh, lets them save me as a contact. And I'm not giving them my uh, personal information, of course not. <laughs> so, but I am giving them my school information. So things that I posted on here is my school email. And, you know, many parents may not be able to spell Delgadillo. So that, I, you know, it's not my email. It's not necessarily like the simplest email. And so they can just click on that and email me. I have my website again in there. My school phone number is in there. My Amazon wish list is there and my donors choose is there. And then that message that is 17 minutes long, it's there. And um, so if you wanna check out any of that, that's going to be in there for you. Um, you can scan this code and you can see all my stuff. You can see what I share with parents. And just keep in mind that I have not updated it yet, but it will be updated on Tuesday. And um, I also, because I use Popple for personal reasons as well, other than teaching reasons, I actually do have the premium version. Um, 
And the other thing about Bubble is that they have, um, so you can just share the QR code. You can share it like, I don't know if you can see it because it's kind of blurry. Um, but there's a QR code on my phone in here, right there. And you can share it with parents that way. Or also, I have a keychain that has the QR code that parents can scan. And I have um, a, a little dot on my phone that I just, instead of uh, opening my phone and doing the QR code, I can just press it against somebody's phone and it will give them my couple information. So it's super cool. Uh, and again, I'm not telling you to go buy this. You don't have to have the, the dot that I have. You can just, with the free version, you can have your website link, your email link, and your phone link. And then you can um, get the free QR code. You don't have to pay anything. So definitely check out Popple uh, if that's something you think you want to share with students. Okay, so do we have it? Are there any questions? Let me pause before I go into the next category. Are there any questions about you know setting up for open house? And again, um, these are things that I have come to do over the years, and they're just very easy for me to integrate because, like I said, the website I created it during COVID times. So each year I add an update. The first time I did it, I only had the syllabi in there. Then uh, last year, I added information about our school club and our international skills diplomacy and all of that. So, you know, don't think that, oh, all of this came together in one time, in one sitting. It does not work that way. Um, and Popple, I learned from Meredith White, and I uh, started using it for several reasons. And I really, really like it. And people normally, they think it's super cool when they do the Popple. Uh, so... On day one, I and and I know in here we had um we had uh, Andrea who shared. I introduce myself and use a lot of cognate words to build confidence. So yes, that is also something that is so important to do. I've been doing this for years, and I actually um I need to add the link in here uh, with Claudia because I had a chat with Claudia on Thursday in my Instagram. And um, and we talked about this. We talked about this again. And actually, I, we've done lives in the past, Claudia Elliott and I, where we talk about these things. And we've been doing this for years. It is honestly, in my opinion, one of the best ways to start the school year and the first day. So I'm not telling you what you know you should and shouldn't do, but I would say one thing. I personally avoid starting um, to talk about the syllabus because every single class the students are there and they're hearing about the syllabus and the do's and the don'ts and they're bored out of their mind. There's a few teachers that you know may not do that and that's cool, but most of them do. I don't know why they're still doing that, but <laughs> most of them do. And um, that's one reason I don't address the syllabus until later. Uh, and there are other ways we can address the syllabus too, depending on, on, on our learners, right? So what I like to do on day one is forget about, I think routines are important. Yes, we must establish the routines, but I used to be so stressed out years ago, even like five, six years ago um, about, oh my God, did I make the list of all the routines I have to teach my students and all the expectations I have to teach my students? Do I have everything together? Do I have my LMS codes ready? Do I have my, um, what is it, my formative, because I use formative. Do I have that ready? Do I have this ready? Do I have my classroom job sheet ready? And I just came down crashing because it was so much stress to think about that. And now I know better. And I know that routines are going to be taught as we go the first couple of days or in the first two weeks. Uh, I remember, I kid you not, back in maybe my second or third year teaching, I literally had a PowerPoint with all the rules that were important to my class when I had like 20 rules and all the routines and expectations. And it was so bore boring. I don't know how I could put my students through that, but I did. I did, and I also stressed myself out, making sure I had X, Y, and Z. But no, the best way to get started with routines is to do it gradually, right? We don't have to go over everything at once. 
And that's wonderful. So the only routine that I kind of introduced the first day um, is the brain breaks routine. So if uh, brain breaks are something that I like to do in my classroom and I like to bring a variety of them. Some of them are, you know, crazy ones and outgoing ones. And some of them are just calm, silly, quick ones. And some of them are mindfulness ones. So I like to have a variety of brain breaks and I have those already um, saved. All, I have compiled several brain breaks from different people like La Maestra Loca or Carolina Gomez and different people that I like their brain breaks. I have uh, uh, you know some videos that I put together. Uh, and then there's, uh, I know Senorita Spanish has a really good link for brain breaks too that she has shared for free in her blog. And I have her slides too, to do the brain breaks. So that way it's just easy to, to have those slides ready if I need them, right? So I do teach them a break, brain break routine. My classes are 90 minutes long. Uh, anybody else in here has 90 minute classes? Yes. No. Okay. Yes. So there's, a, it seems like half and half people do. Um, but yeah, so for 90 minute classes, we need at least two brain breaks, at least if we're not doing like active games, we need probably more than that. But yeah, so we want to make sure we have brain breaks and we, you know, we talk to the learners about what, why brain breaks are important. And, um, and then we just do that. And then uh, over here, uh, students, they are curious about us. They want to know, uh, they want to know the team, all right? They want to know what, what you're all about and they want to know how you're going to grade them and, you know, how they're going to learn with you. They want to know those things. So what do you think students will want to know about you? Or what are some things that your students have proven to want to know about you over the years? that we may share with them. And Andrea, maybe you can tell us like what information you include on your slide if you're comfortable with that. If not, you don't have to. Um, but because you know, you are going to share about yourself the first couple of days, you share about yourself with what you're comfortable with. We don't, you know, if you are not comfortable about sharing something, then don't share it and that's okay. But we can still share. So what are some things that our students maybe curious about to know about us, like personal information that we are comfortable sharing that they may want to know about us. Excellent, so we have nationalities, hobbies, interests, family, hobbies. Right, so all of this is absolutely correct. Pets, yes. Families, interesting facts, nationality, excellent. So that's all wonderful because you know many of these, many of these, um, of these things that students want to know about us. Those are things that are very easy to make super comprehensible for them. And one thing to keep in mind is that. When our students come to our class, they even if they're coming to level three, I don't know if you have found out, but just because they're in level three does not mean they are, you know, novice high or intermediate low. And and we cannot assume that, you know, they are a specific level. So we want to make sure that when we introduce ourselves, our students know um on our understanding. So we have a presentation that we create about ourselves. You can create a presentation about yourself, a couple slides, not too much, because we don't want this to be longer. I, I try not to have mine longer than 15 minutes. Um, so I may just talk about, you know, the things that you said. I share about my family. I share about where I was, where I'm from. I share about my pet patron. Uh, you know, he's a chihuahua. And I talk about um, things like, uh, of hobbies too, and uh, an interest as well. I tell them my age. That is something that for some reason, it's always, <laughs> I let them guess my age at the beginning, but I, I then tell them my age. And actually when I'm introducing my sisters, cause I, I have, I introduce, you know, my home, like who I live with, but I also introduce my mom and my two sisters. So when I'm introducing my, my mom and then I introduce my, um, 
sister in the middle and then my little sister and then I tell them we're all seven years apart then they have to do the math and then they realize how old I am so that's kind of how I let them uh figure out how old I am and I'm okay with sharing that I understand not everybody is okay sharing their age with them but I really don't care uh about that personally um and and yes yeah, so I deliver this information comprehensively now normally not normally my level two students, they don't know anything about me, okay? They don't know anything about me, so this is easy to do with them. But what about when you have students who have you before in level three, because I'm the only teacher teaching level three, and most of them had me for level two, if not half of them had me for level two. So I have to change things a little bit, a little bit for them. Um, maybe it could be that um, I can create uh, a short reading for my new students who do not, who I did not have for level two because in my school I teach level two and my uh, colleague teaches level two so the ones who did not have me for level two maybe I can have them uh, I can do a little reading and I can do a little video where I'm pretty much saying what I normally will tell my level twos right so I can have them do independent work with that and then I could have the students who are, they had me before for level two. I can play a game with them while the other students are working on that. I can play a game of like what, things that have changed. I have things that have changed since last year. Um, and one thing that I could bring out that they're not gonna remember how old I am. Some of them will, but not all of them are going to remember how old I am. Or I can play a question game about me because they already should know this information. They had me before, right? I could play a, uh, or I could go to Jeopardy Labs and uh, I could create a Jeopardy game about me or we could play a Kahoot where we're just checking comprehension about me uh, because they already know me. They already know this information and, and we can do that. Uh, and then we can invite the other group who watched the little video or who read the little text about me and, and they can all play the game together. So that's one way that I kind of differentiated because sometimes, <laughs> all the time in level three, half of them know me because they had me and the other half are brand new to me. So that's useful uh, for me as well. And I actually learned about uh, creating a presentation, like when it actually clicked for me, that was years ago, I forgot, it was maybe in 2016 that I was reading uh, the creative language class by, um, Oh my, Megan, Megan Smith, uh, and I forgot the other lady's name, Cara Parker, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. They had uh, the creative language class, and in there they had made a blog post about how they introduced themselves at the beginning of the year. And yeah, so it's a great opportunity. Something else that you can share, most world language teachers, we are avid travelers. We can share where we have traveled and our favorite place where we have been. And um, and that and obviously I like to make my presentation in Canva because I can easily put pictures and make co things comprehensible. I can put all kinds of pictures so that everything's comprehensible to the learner. So that's why I like to do it in Canva as opposed to Google Slides. Even though Google Slides is easier to work, um, Canva just helps me make everything more comprehensible through images because you can find just about any image uh, to do that. And then let's see what else, where do we go from there? So from there, I like to do, so on day one, I'm talking about me, right? And I introduce myself through a slideshow. And then after, and let me go back to this one. After I talk to my learners about me, then, I would write on the board a little summary of what I said. It will be a summary in very comprehensible Spanish for my learners. So it could be like uh, the teacher, her name, the teacher's uh, name is uh, Profe Delgadillo. She is from Mexico. She is also, she is this many years old and she lives with uh, her husband and her son and her dog, uh, her, do her dog's name is Patron. Her son attends Woodville Tompkins, which is the school where I work usually, 
that's a that's a high point of interest for my learners to find out who my son is because my son attends the same school where I teach and um also, uh, she likes to do this, this, and that, but she does not like to do this, this, and that. So this is stuff that you know I had talked about in my presentation. I make a paragraph text about it, and I make them write it. I make them write it um, because you know we want to make sure we model writing skills early on. Many of the students, if they're level two, and even if they're level three. They, they may be lacking on writing. So it's good for them to have a sample in there. And then after we do that writing on the board, we can do choral translation, or we could just don't do the translation, just have them read so that they can just read out loud and feel successful. But honestly, it comes down to that. It comes down to making sure that when the students walk out of a room on day one, they experience nothing but success in your class. They understood everything you said, or most of it. They um, were successful at the activities you asked them to do, like you know, true or false questions, or multiple choice questions, or the Kahoot, or you know whatever it is you played. They did great on the brain break. So we want to make sure they have a super successful day because maybe that was not the norm in their previous class. I don't know about you, but in my school, um, I have students who come from level two and they went to different middle schools. And uh, so there, there's no telling. Some of them had great experiences. Some of them didn't have great experiences. And they'll tell you right off the bat, they'll be like, um, I hated Spanish one or whatever. And we're like, well, we are in a different class right now. So every teacher deserves a, you know, a new chance. So that, that's, we try to, we're trying honestly to to make sure that we start on a blank slate in Spanish too, if they had a negative previous experience. Uh, so that's important. Now on day two, and of course on day one, we're focusing on building community and a safe and building that safe environment. But on day two, this is more um, evident. Uh, and the one way that I do this, and I have done this for years, and this works for me too, is to have a special person interview. And basically what that is, they also call it star of the day interview. And basically what that is, is you're going to have a slideshow of a few um, questions that have, um, and that, that have the support system. So um, we need to make sure that we have a slideshow with that. And I'm gonna share with you, I'm, I'm gonna show you, I don't know if you already have, you may already have my hexagonal thinking activity. You can tell me in the chat, yes, no. And I will um, and I will share with you the link to that activity right now in just a second. But I'm gonna find it. So let me see if I can bring it over here. There we go. Okay, so these are some of the questions that I have for the first day of school. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to bring the whole folder here. Well, I have the whole folder here, but let me share with you. Um, Okay, this should take you to that folder, okay? And I'm gonna email you these links anyway, so you're gonna have these links uh, with you. But if you actually wanna check out this resource now, uh, I'm just share with you in the chat. So basically what I have, I have a document that I use for the first days of school. That's when they come into the class, I give them a hexagon. I give them a hexagon and I tell them, this is my first activity. I tell them to go ahead and try to answer the questions as much as they can and illustrate their answer. And obviously I print this out for them so they can see my example uh, and you know what I like and what I love and how I illustrated mine. And then they do the same. And I tell them in the slideshow that I have when they come in, it's like find their seat and start answering these questions. If they can't answer the question, I said, just skip it, that's fine. Because they're gonna be able to answer it later. So it's not a big deal. If you can't answer all the questions, don't worry about it. And uh, then after that, you know, I let them hang on to that. And then I get a volunteer 
uh, to be the special person of the day. And I never not have not had a volunteer. Okay, never ever ever have not or have had an issue getting a volunteer. So and and even with level two with the students who do not know me. So normally I said, oh, you know, I would love. Um, we're gonna do this activity and. Uh, I need a volunteer and this will and don't, I don't want you to be stressed out about it because you're going to have all the language you need to be successful. So when I say that, if because I established some level of trust the day before, I do have a couple of people who raise their hand to be a volunteer. And then they come in there and they sit in the middle and then I introduce them and then I said, oh, my God, you know, you're so brave and blah, 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 blah. And everybody claps and all of that. And then, um, you know, I start asking the first question, you know, what is your name? And then, you know, the student answers. And then, you know, we go on to the second question. And then it's like, what is your birthday? And then the student answer. And then I may ask, who else has a birthday on that month? Or something like that to make connections, right? Um, and then I would say, oh, you know, my birthday is in October. Any other October babies in here? Blah, 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 blah right? And then uh, I asked the next question until I finished the questions. But I tried. I don't just ask the question. When I'm asking the question, I also try to make connections with the other students who are listening. But like I said, uh, because when they came in, I gave them the hexagon and they were supposed to start illustrating. Once we're back, once I have my volunteer in the middle, if there were two or three questions that students could not answer for whatever reason, with this slideshow at the end of this, all the students will have a hexagon done. And all of them would have been able to complete the hexagon, uh, you know, successfully. October baby, Warren. <laughs> yes, October baby. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's how we make uh, connections. And that's what I use. So after I have my interview with that one student, we're going to do the same routine we did the day before. I'm going to write a paragraph about it, right? And they're going to record it on their composition book or on a piece of paper. And then we're, I'm going to play a true or false game or pass the marker game or whatever game that you have that you love the easy game low prep game I'm sure we can think of one easy low prep game so then you do that and make sure that they have their text and like I said I make them write when I write about the person I make them write it there are people uh CI enthusiasts who say don't make them write anything and that's fine like I understand that it's probably better if they don't write it because you want them to be paying attention. But with my babies, they need to write it because otherwise they're not gonna pay attention. So I make my babies write the things. And then also later on, if I have them to write a paragraph about themselves, they can reference as needed on those paragraphs. And then, you know, they can, they can, um, they can recreate their own paragraph. So there are more activities with this, um, so here's the hexagons. You will just need to make, let's say you have classes like me. My classes are have been 30 or less historically. Let me knock on wood so that that doesn't change. Uh, but normally I need to make 15 copies per class. And I just cut it in the middle and then I give the hexagons. And then what happens, and the reason I love doing these hexagons is because I keep them and because I don't know their names, this is what I used to call on them the first couple of days. And this is what I may use to, you know, make a connection with them the first couple of days. And, uh, you know, after a couple of uh, the second day, we may play this game where I have them in groups and they have to roll the dice and then they just ask random questions. And, you know, another person needs to they need to try to uh, use integrate um, rejoinders to to create connections and you know this is a short activity it should be like less than 10 minutes activity from the grouping to everything and honestly is it true um is it true output absolutely not but remember our goal here is to make sure they feel successful those first couple of days so the questions are there they have their own little hexagons with their answers 
and then they can do that. And once they do that, what I have them do is I have them connect their hexagon. So if I have a group of six students, I have them connect their hexagons like this. And I have them connect all the six hexagons like this. So I have one group who's connected all their hexagons. So this student likes history and this student likes history. The student's goal for the class is to pass the class with an A. Notice that this thing here does not match and that's okay. Not everything has to match. Just find one match. The student's word of the year is peace. The student birthday is in August. So do we see how they all found something they had in common in one group? And then what I have them do is go find another, once they complete, they all found their connection within the group. I said, this group, go find another group and connect the hexagon, connect it. So then at the end, we have one big collage of hexagons and you know all the students are connected. So um, I absolutely love to do that. Now, by that time, normally, you know, by day three, I now have my popsicle sticks because I make popsicle sticks for students and I won't need this to call on them anymore because now I have my popsicle sticks. Uh, but yeah, that's what I do with the hexagons. Uh, it allows me to do a lot of activities and um, and I really, really, really enjoy it. Uh, something else that you can do, um, how are they going to connect it? They can connect it with tape so that they don't ruin it. Or if you have a big bulletin board, they can connect it with, what do we call these things? Tax, right? Tax, tax, is that what we call them? You, you can give them tax carefully, of course, and they can connect, connect it with tax. It could be a one day collage thing, and then you can take them up and then you can continue to use them to call on them, calling cards if you want to. It is up to you. But there's a lot of flexibility in these hexagons. So you have that activity in there. Something else I wanted to point out was the um, how, uh, the special person interview. So if you have not done special person interviews, uh, you definitely, the person I learned this from, I don't remember who I learned it from. Uh, I believe it was Bright's Headstrom. But thanks to Kara Jacobs resources, is that I started implementing special interviews. So if you go over here, even though these are old, these are great. Like if you don't want to go buy anything, you can see um, you can see her question slideshow. So I gave you a question slideshow with the hexagon um, activity. You have back to school question slideshow, right? You have one for back to school, specific for back to school. But these other ones from Kara are about just, just uh, you could use it for second week of school because there are other questions. Or you could make your own in Canva, but this is like, if you need some ideas, like what other questions could I include later on that would be good? Like she has a bunch of those uh, in there that you can uh, look at. And I definitely recommend you read this blog post because she kind of tells you uh, her take on it. And it was thanks to this blog post um, that I uh, began to use it more and more and more. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to share, where was it? Over here. So um, don't, like I said, don't force, when you do the first special person interview, don't force it, ask for a volunteer. And I think one of the reasons why I don't have issues getting volunteers on day two for this is because the first day we talked about ourselves, right? So we were vulnerable about opening the door and letting them get to know us and our families and our likes and our dislikes. And I think the second day students you know, they do acknowledge that maybe they don't know, but they just feel like they trust you a little bit more. And for that reason, it's you will have a volunteer um, on day two. Like I just I just again, haven't had somebody um, never had an issue with getting a volunteer. And again, just encourage the students to answer and illustrate their own responses. So this activity. I give them the hexagon as they walk in. I tell them to try to answer as many questions on their own without any scaffolds. 
but I do put in there, do not worry. This is written in English. Do not worry if you cannot answer any one question, you'll be able to answer them before the end of the period. So in a way I'm making them a promise, right? You're gonna get this done. And yes, they get this done before the end of the period and they feel successful. So day two of class, complete success. Uh, do the special person interview student, is the special person interview student also doing the hexagonal? Yes, and you can give them extra time because since they were doing the interview, they're not doing it at the same time. They're gonna go back to their seat later and complete it and then they need to take it home and finish it. Not just the person who, um, who was doing the interview, but you might have students who take a lot longer for whatever reason. Just let them take it home and finish it and bring it to you the next day and that's okay. And um, the other beautiful thing about this hexagon is that now uh, I use it at the beginning of the year. And now this is how I do my, um, when I open new units or new, th new thematic units, I like to start with personalized questions and answers. So anytime I'm gonna open a new unit, I'm going, I always started with personalized questions and answers. And it used to go like, I have the slideshow with the question, right? And the pictures and the scaffolds. And I asked the students and I have the same five or seven who are you know, eager to share their response. Or I may tell everybody to write their response on their individual dry erase board so that I can have everybody participate. And everybody can have a voice instead of having those dominant students and not dominant because they're like that, but they're just, you know, the ones that are always sharing. And um, so when I do this now, what I do is anytime I'm going to open a new unit, I think of six questions and I do this exact same activity when I'm going to open a new unit. So every time I open a new unit, they have the six questions. Uh, that are personalized questions and answers that I want them to be able to answer uh, in the target language by the end of the unit. And of course, we're gonna learn so many more things and we're gonna build on more speaking skills and more writing skills by the end of the unit. But just to open it up, I have them do hexagons like this. So with this template alone, with this little blank te template alone, you can create your own questions on Canva, six questions for another unit, and then you can reuse this and do the same thing, which exact same activity, exact same activity. You can have them play the dice activity, and then you can have them um, do the illustration, and then you can have them put in groups to see how they their opinions connect to build communities. So it is something that you can replicate, and I'm all for not having to prep again and again and again, something different. And students honestly appreciate routine. Now, if it gets to a point where you're bored with your routine, they're gonna be bored too. So change it up for something else and that's okay. But you know, when it's something new, it, it, it takes a while for it to wear off. Okay, so let me go back over here. Uh, I have one more thing to share with you. And I'm going, and that has to do with um, just classroom management. And I know that not everybody, you know, we are at different levels and we have different student uh, populations in our school. And some of our administration is probably, you know, more consistent than other people's administration. So there's a variety of things that will make classroom management harder for us, right? Some of it has to do with how we handle it and you know how we present ourselves with the class, but a lot of it also has to do with external factors, which you know, what experiences our students bring. And we have a lot of students whose parents will come and get them in the middle of the day just to, <laughs> I mean, for silly reasons, not even like doctor appointment or anything like that. And then we also have, some people may have inconsistent support with administration, and that also factors in into the behavior problems that we may have in our classes, and it has nothing to do with the teachers, it just has to do with the lack of support. So regardless of what it may be, I have one more thing that I wanna share with you. Uh, and normally I share this on week two. So on week two, that's when I'm actually handing out my syllabi. Uh, and you can uh, take a pic of my syllabi if you go to this link right here, 
that's where you can see my full syllabus in there. Uh, and I have it on my TPT store, um, like the exact same model. So you can change it and edit it if you would like to take a look at that. Uh, you can just go to my TPT store and it'll be in there. And then the other thing I have on my TPT store is my classroom, um, like behavior intervention plan. Um, so I, so when I started teaching, I started teaching at a school that was extremely challenging. I had students who had who were in sixth grade, who had anklet bracelets, and who had parole officers coming to visit them and during class. So it was a very challenging school. And it was my first experience. And I was there for two years. And I would have stayed longer, uh, but I decided to change because I, ever since I graduated from my college program, even though I didn't start teaching right after it for other reasons, uh, life, life reasons, um, I knew that I wanted to teach high school. That was my dream from ever since I was, in, you know, going to school to college to be a teacher. Uh, so, but I started in a middle school because I started in the middle of the year and I started in this particular middle school. And I remember that in that middle school, we had to have a behavior intervention plan. We had to, we could not afford not to. We wrote so many referrals daily. We called parents daily. I got tired of hearing, I, don't, I mean, cricket is no longer like a, 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 a cell phone carrier, I don't think, because I don't hear many people talking about cricket. But back in the day, it was, I would call and it would be the cricket phone number has been disconnected or whatever. Like I would get a lot of that on the phone calls, um, on, on the phone numbers for my, for my students' parents and things like that. So it was very, very, very rough for me. However, like I said, we could not afford to have uh, behavior intervention plan. So I use that for my first two years. And then when I can transition to the school where I've been at for several years now, um, eight years and counting. And when I transitioned here, I never have had a need to pull out my behavioral intervention plan until last year, first semester. Last year, first semester, I had a class where I had five people who I really don't think they should be together in any class. So um, you know how sometimes you have students who are great separately, but when they get with specific people, it's a complete different person. This is the kind of thing that was happening here. And it started happening gradually. So we lived through the honeymoon phase because you know we have that honeymoon phase where everything's peaceful and everything. We had gone over that. And then I started noticing this child who kept interrupting me. And then it just got annoying. And um, and obviously I was not trying to let it get to me. I had my one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and everything, but nothing changed. And then this other student, you know, who was a friend and then all of these other things that were horrible, just, I was like, I cannot have this in my classroom. This is not, this is not acceptable in my classroom. And I never had it happen at this level, at this level in a way that, in that classroom of those 30 students, like 25 students were wonderful. They were wonderful. They were there and they wanted to learn, but these five students, and I was like, no, I ha I mean, and obviously I was not taking it personal because we should never take things personal. We really, really shouldn't for our own health and well being. Um, but for me, it was more of a matter of, I have 25 children who want to learn and I'm not going to allow five to keep them from 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 learning and acquiring language. That's just not something I'm okay with. So I pulled out <laughs> my old behavior intervention plan from middle school and that's what I started using. And basically a behavior intervention plan has um it's gonna have it's it's a contract that you create for your learners and you tell your students, you tell your learners, um this is what I, my promise to you. This is my part and what I'm willing to do for you and this class. And this is my commitment to this class. You go over that with them. And then you also go over what is expected of them as, as a student in your class. And that's, you know, that's kind of like regular stuff, but then you, you uh, have them, you, you give them that paper and you have them sign it and you have the parents sign it. And you also go over what are the steps 
because in your school is going to be different than mine, right? In my school, I mean, like I have pretty much free reign on what I can do, but um, but you you tell them what are the steps. So first, I'm going. If you are, you know, if you are not um helping me lead a, a conducive classroom environment, then we're going. I'm going to have a one on one conversation with you, or maybe no. Before that, I'm going to have a re one redirection for you, or maybe two redirections for you, and then I'm going to have a one on one conversation. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to message your parent. Or maybe you want to jump all of that and you want to message the parent like right away. If that's you, you change it however you want. And that's what you want to do. So basically, it, you create a document where you tell them what your promise is for the class, right? Realistic. Don't tell them, oh, you're going to receive your papers greater within one day. I don't know, maybe that, maybe Amy would do that because, you know, she's awesome at great. But Profe Delgadillo is not going to do that. She's going to give you the papers within three three days, if so. Um, so, um, but yeah, you tell them what it is that you're going to do uh, to make the class a success and what you expect from them in order to make sure the class is a success for everybody. You make, the, and then you tell them, if this is not happening in the class, then you are going to um you're going to do a redirection then you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a the student then you're going to call home then you're going to give them a detention and then you're going to you know refer them to administration so i have i have all of that on one piece of paper and uh, i go over that with them at this point we have also done skits over class rules which is something else that I don't necessarily cover on the first two days. It's more like of a next week, day three thing where I talk about my class rules. I have the poster in my room and it's just like five very simple rules. Whatever your rules are, just, you know, if you like your rules, keep your rules. Uh, but what I like to have my students do is I have them to work in groups. So I put them in small groups, groups of three, right? And I have, uh, and I give each of them the uh, the rule, one rule written. And I tell each group, do not share with other groups what rule you have. And your role is to act out that rule being modeled positively or negatively. And we're supposed to guess. So instead of me going over the rules, I just let them, um, I mention my rules and then I put them in groups and then I'm let them do skits because they know what, you know, good modeling looks like and they know what bad modeling looks like. So I have them do that activity. It's like a group activity. And this activity, if I'm doing it with level two, it's, and even with level three, sometimes it's gonna be done in English and that's okay. I need them to understand and everybody needs to understand what the classroom rules are for me. So I have those. And then in addition to my, and it's not five classroom rules that I have actually, six. But in addition to my six classroom rules, I have three secret classroom rules that I stole from Meredith White. And instead, they're not really like necessarily rules, but we named them that. So there's three secret ones that I stole from Meredith White, which is uh, don't lie to me, don't make me look bad, and don't waste my time. So I introduce the six rules to my students and then I tell them, uh, class, we have secret rules. I, and I will say this part in Spanish because you know it's a lot of comments, right? So we have six, three secret rules. Like everybody has to know these three secret rules, but they're not written on the rules. But you will hear about these rules later on. And then I tell them what they are. And then, you know, we talk about what it means. Don't lie to me. Like, for example, if you didn't get your work done by the deadline, don't lie to me. Just tell me why you didn't get it done. Even if it's like, I didn't care to get your work done because whatever reason. That, I will honor that much better than you lying to me. Don't make me look bad. If I'm out because and I have a sub, do not make me look bad. If I have an observation, do not make me look bad. Because if I look bad, I'm going to make your grade look bad too. And so, you know, like I will joke around with them on things like that. And I mean, it's a joke, but, you know, in a way it's like, I'm serious about this. And um, so, yeah, or like, so don't lie to me. Don't waste my time. Uh, what does don't waste my time mean? 
how is it connected to the other six rules? What other of those six rules could be linked to don't waste my time? And somebody will raise their hand and be like, be respectful to everybody. Because if you have to stop class to address something, then, you know, it's, that's wasting everybody's time and your time. So, you know, there, especially if you're teaching, if you, <laughs> and, and uh, Warren, like mic drop for Meredith White, because she's the one who shared those three rules with me. But I, I actually, like I said, I, since I already had my six rules that work for me, I decided to add them as secret rules. And as secret rules, they're the best. Because when I'm going to be gone, like if I go to conferences and I do that a lot, or I go to other things that they send me out to, like the school sometimes sends me out to do other things. And um, when that happens, I tell them, I'm going to be out. What are my three secret rules? And which one is the one that matters the most when I'm out? And they'll be like, don't make you look bad. And um, and yeah, and actually last semester, I had a guest in my class and I had a student who decided to violate <laughs> my rule. Don't make me look bad. And um, after my guest left, I addressed that. And of course, I did not punish the whole class because that was, everybody was fine. But I, I did say class, did you see what just happened? And, you know, they're obviously they were like, yeah, yeah. Like, and so I said, well, since everybody else was amazing, I'm not going to, you know, take it out and everybody, let me make a phone call right now and let me address this right now. So, you know, that's the way I kind of handle that. And again, you, you will know how I'm, I'm, you are experienced teachers in here. Uh, and Obviously, you know what works for you and your personality as far as classroom management goes. But I think having that contract at the beginning of the year um, helps so much. And I, was, I have semester classes. So I have um, first semester and second semester. So I use my contract the first semester. And technically, I only needed the contract for that one class because my other classes were great but I still brought it to the other classes. And then the second semester, honestly, I did not need that contract at all, but I still brought it to those classes. And I'm and, and I'm like, yep, I'm back to doing this contract as part of my back to school routine because it's so important to have, you know, to make sure that the parents know how this is gonna go down in case it needs to go down. Um, and yeah, so do we have any questions about uh, anything that we have addressed? I'm gonna share with you one um, blog post link and then I'll sh I will send you an email with uh, the recording of this in case you wanna share it with somebody. Uh, and I will share with you the link to this presentation because I'm gonna add more uh, links to it, two more links to it, and then I'll send it with you. But I am so grateful that you came to spend uh, this time with me. Let me know if there are any uh, questions before we um, close out. And I'm going to do one more thing, one more drop. One more link drop. Where you can see pictures of my, um, of my classroom management, um, my behavior intervention plan. It's right here. So I just shared this link, but I'm going to add that link too. You can see, if you scroll down, you can see uh, uh, the picture of the contract that I have drafted for my students. The one, the actual picture of, of, that I sent home. And then I also created a behavior notice. So once a student, um, I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a student, then, you know, I have the student, I document that but I'm not gonna document that. I'm gonna let my student document that. So, uh, cause you know, who has time to be documenting this? Like, no, I'm, I have the paperwork, but I'm gonna let the student document it. Uh, question, how do you handle phones and Google Translate? Okay, so no, uh, phones is something that at the beginning, I'm just like, if you are strong on it at the beginning, you're not gonna have that problem later on. Um, because, you know, you want to be like strong and serious about it. And uh, the other thing that I do, like I give them one of my brain breaks sometimes could be that I give them five minutes to look at their phone and, and that's okay. Like I would say, okay, three minutes of phone time. So if I schedule that in into the class, 
then, you know, I normally don't have issues with phone because they know that during the middle of class, they're going to be able to look at their phones. And then something else that I do to help minimize the phone usage is that I have um, chargers for them. So many times they are okay leaving their phone on the charger and instead of having them on their pocket. And, and that also works for me. When I do take up their phones for the entire class, it is during, <laughs> yes, Warren, tech time for teens. I love that. TTT. Uh, so um, what, I, what I do is during quizzes and tests, I do take up their phones. I make it, even if it's not necessary, needed, uh, I still take them up. So anytime they're going to do a quiz and a test, I have the little things from Amazon where it's like you have, you can uh, house 30 phones. It's like a pocket thing with 30 slots and you can put all the phones in there. So I have that in my in, in, in my wall and I assign each student a number and everybody has to put their phone there before we take an assessment or before we do a quiz. So that sends the message of like, you know, we're going, they're going to be using a device for an assignment. No, they're not. Uh, and that eliminates that Google Translate. But honestly, I don't have a huge issue with Google Translate personally. And um, one of the reasons is that I give my students everything they need to be successful. Like if whatever the writing assignment is, they have had so many scaffolds along the way, whether that's a chat mat or whether that's text we have written collectively in the class that they can refer to to write their own paragraphs and things like that. Um, normally, when students use Google Translate, it's because they're too lazy to do the assignment themselves. But, or we are, or we're asking something that's way above their level. So if it's something that's way above their level, yes, they're going to go to Google Translate. If it's something that um, they are going, they haven't, they don't haven't had enough support for, they're going to go to Google Translate. And also, we need to show them how to. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, this is just my personal opinion, but I believe that we need to show them how to use uh, websites like Word Reference or Lingui. Lingui is my favorite one personally. Um, we need to teach them how to use it properly. And I actually have a podcast episode that I did with Joshua Cabral uh, for Word Language Classroom. And let me see if I can find it. And um, in that podcast episode, uh, it's called Online Translators. It's, uh, that's what we talk about in that one. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so in that uh, in that podcast episode, I actually was talking to Joshua about how when I go to Spain, even though I'm a native speaker, they're they you know they have different words for so many like for foods and things like that and I have to go to Google and look at pictures of what the food looks like or I have to go to Google and go to the uh, translator to see what that means to me so our students are do need to know how to use a translator properly so I think you know we can teach them that and if you go to teachers pay teachers I think um Jade from La Secundaria, that's her TPT store name. She has a fabulous product that is digital that just guides the students through how to use um, sites like Word Reference and things like that. Because our students today don't know how to look up words in a dictionary. They don't know how to look up words in an online translator. Um, and sadly, <laughs> I mean, like for example, if they go find a, a dictionary, they pick a word that's a verb and not a noun when they actually need the noun. So those things, we cannot assume that they come to the classroom knowing that. And that's why, you know, but but yes, so to go to answer your question, um, how do you handle phones? Start strong, super strong at the beginning, and you're going to save yourself headaches. Uh, give them time to use the phone. That's the trade-off. You know, I, there's allocated class time to use the phone. Three or five minutes. Instead of a brain break, maybe do that. Maybe you don't want to do that every day. But like in my in my case, because I have 90 minute classes, yes, one of my brain breaks will be a phone break. And that's fine. And we move on. And um, 
and yeah, so that's how I suggest the phones and Google Translate is just a matter of providing scaffolds for them. If you notice that a lot of students did Google Translate or in specific activity, then you know we need to kind of um, examine what we asked them to do and what how we supported them uh, along the way to be able to to do that specific thing. And, and, and that's one of the things um, that led me to transition from traditional teaching to using more acquisition driven instruction and comprehensible input is that, yes, I was teaching all the grammars. Yes, I was quizzing all the vocabulary. Yes, we were having fun playing games, but I wasn't modeling writing enough. I wasn't scaffolding enough. So when I was teaching traditionally, I got a lot of Google Translate and that's what got me looking into, hey, I don't want them to be doing this. And um, and I'm not saying it never happens to me, but it, it, it's like, it might be one person and then I address it and then it doesn't happen again. Okay, yes, Andrea. So I'm gonna mute because it might be a loaded question. <laughs> So, but uh, listen, I took your Pearl class earlier in, I think it was the end of June uh, or the beginning of June or something like that. And I loved it. And one of my, I think, and I'm starting with all the CI trying to get into making sure my biggest concern, and if you can help me and maybe if you have a, a resource or a person that I can follow, of course, I follow you and Meredith and 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 people like that. But the 90 minutes is just to be on for 90 minutes is too much. It's just like constantly talking and acting things out. It's exhausting for me. I'm 55 and I'm not ashamed to say it. So I honest and it's exhausting for them as well. So I want to give them 15 minutes of intense and then practice. But I find that I fall, my fallback is the drill and kill. So, and it's horrible for them. And it's horrible for me too, because now I have to collect paperwork and grade and all these things. So, you know, for me, I wanted to just get some resources and, 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 and build on one thing. I'm definitely going to use your hexagon idea. And maybe that's all I will do this year. And I'm okay with that, you know, because I want to grow, but I want to do it properly and not feel like I'm burned out the rest of the year and not want to go back to teaching. I got 10 more years before I can retire. So this is very important for me. So if you have anything that you can share or if you um, find that somebody does it really well, uh, that would be so helpful. And I love what you've shared. I have loved, I, I came back today because I loved your class in June. So just so you know, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Well, I would say that um, you don't, I, I know, and I actually have talked about this with my friend Claudia and with my friend Annabelle, and I'm actually going to, both of them have blogs. I don't have blogs because I wouldn't be able to keep up with it. I'm not a blogger. I mean, I have a blog, but obviously I don't blog as much and, and I don't have a set schedule. But Claudia and Annabelle both have podcasts. I personally would not be able to keep up with a podcast. So I can definitely send them um, this, this topic because this is something we have discussed collectively uh, that we give people the idea that, um, and, and by we, I mean like instructors who use acquisition-driven instruction, comprehensible input, that you have to be on all the time and you don't. You don't have to be on all the time. So um, what does need to happen, however, you do have to find, and this happens with time. I would say for me and everybody's journey is gonna be different. When I first um, started teaching with more comprehensible input was in 2016. So it was not until maybe year two or three that I had a solid tool belt that were my go-to activities uh, for different uh, communication modes. So it takes some time, but um, you will realize that you don't you you don't have to be on because that is unsustainable. Oh, you're absolutely correct. So you want to make sure that when you deliver your input, it's like 15 minutes. Then they do a comprehension check. It could be led by you. It could even be led by a student, or it could be an activity where they make they you know they they uh, there's a lot of activities 
where um, the students can um, draw, you can give them a story and then they can draw like a, a comic of, of what they understood from the story. And they can create like a one sentence summary of a story so that you are not the one on and projecting all the time. So my suggestion, and there's there's a ton, there's, there, there are a ton of activities. And as a matter of fact, let me see if I can find the blog post. Uh, but Maris Hawkins, who is one of the co-authors of Common Ground, she recently shared a blog post where she's talking about ideas for classroom novels. But many of those activities are not only for classroom novels. They're just simply good comprehension checks. And she gives like so many ideas in one place. And um, I highly uh, suggest that. Let me see if I can find that link very quickly. Mm. Um, before I do that, let me drop the link for, uh, for Amy, who had asked about online translators. That's the link to the podcast I did with Joshua Cabral. And then let me see if I can find Marys Hawkins. And I know she recently shared um, several resources. Okay, here we go. If you go to her blog, she has so many different ideas. And I'm not telling you to go, you know, like explore the entire blog. But like, for example, that blog post where she has 20 different, 21 different activities for reading it's, it says reading a novel, but you can do it for different uh, concepts. Uh, and you can pick some and find those that work for you. Somebody else that has a lot of activities on their blog consistently is Anne-Marie Chase, Senora Chase. I don't know if you know her, uh, but she has games for days. So when you're playing games, you're not necessarily on. You can be sitting down hosting the game. Uh, and... And it's pretty simple. Um, so what I recommend uh, that you do, and I haven't done this myself, but I been because uh, I'm, I am, I am not. I am organized to my standard, but I'm. I could be so much better, but it's um, it's a long story. But what I would like to do is I would like to create a table. It could be on a Google document that says interpretive reading, interpretive listening, uh, presentational speaking, presentational writing. And in there I can list, go ahead and list in there your activities, Andrea, that you have, that you already use confidently for each one of those communication modes. And then as you start discovering new ones, add it onto that list so that when you're building a lesson, it's not hard for you to build a lesson. It's like, okay, I'm talking for 15 minutes and I'm delivering this input. And I'm, you know, and if you were on my workshop, um, you know, we talk about how to provide those. Uh, when I was talking about the infographic, if you remember, like one slide, right? One slide with keywords uh, so that you can deliver the input. And then after that, you do the write and discuss. And if you don't want to write the write and discuss and you have like a heritage speaker in your class or somebody that is like they can write nicely, even if they're not a heritage speaker, uh, even if you have to make a few corrections, have that student write the thing on the board. You don't even have to write it. Um, so so deliver input, write and discuss, comprehension check. After the comprehension check, you can tell the students to create three questions for each um Every student can write three questions on a sticky note or on a piece of paper about the content, make them multiple choice questions. Then you collect those and then you can um, select some of those questions and then have this have, uh, have a student make like a gim kit of those questions that your students created. So that saves you time. So think about how students can save you time. Because you, you, we do give this idea that you have to be on, but you don't have to be on. You, you don't have to be on. There's a lot of things you can delegate. And um, Mary's Hawkinson's blog has a lot of ideas. Senora Chase's blog has a lot of practical ideas and games and things like that, uh, that you can maybe, you know, try one game each week 
or try one game every other week, whatever is sustainable to you. Okay. Like feel you honestly, like I'm, I'm a big proponent of feeling my energy. Like if I can only handle one time of chaos with a new game, because we know how new games can go, right? If I can only handle that one time a week, I'm only going to do it one time a week. Uh, otherwise I'm going to go to my other activities that, um, that are good. So that is my suggestion. So like try a new one and then brainstorm your own activities. Cause you know, as a teacher, um, you already have your own activities that work and there are activities. If you've been teaching traditionally, there are many activities from traditional teaching that can transfer to, uh, comprehensible input that are, you know, the games and things like that. So you don't have to start from scratch. Okay. All right, are there any more questions before we log off? Can I piggyback on that a little bit? Of course. Because I'm kind of in the same spot that she is, but I'm fortunate because I truly only see the kids for like 43 minutes. So uh, about half that time. Um, I am very excited about this journey, um, have taught traditionally last couple of years. And so, um, the next step obviously is how we take um, the proficiency and line it up to grading, uh, which is probably more than what you can say in about two minutes. But I think that's gonna be another, like my question was exactly what you just asked. Cause I'm like, oh dear, I can do this for even like 20 minutes. And then what do I do with the kids? You know, the second half of class. Uh, so that I feel a little more confident about, but when it gets to like that midpoint or the end of the unit, um, I, yeah, I, I'm going to need a little more time to really kind of think how that might look. Are you thinking about more? I mean, I'm hearing more, you're referencing a grading or are you thinking more in reference of like assessing, like what kind of assessment to give them or like how mm -hmm. to grade that or both? a little bit, probably both, but it would probably start with the assessment first. Cause you know, I'm highly interested right now. We're not standards based as a district. Um, but it just seems like the obvious direction, you know, to line up with our standards that it'd be proficiency. And, you know, um, I'm open to like allowing students to retake, you know, until they're able to um, make the, um, uh, the proficiency level that the, is the goal for them. But I, you know, up to this point, it's been more uh, multiple choice, some, you know, matching with vocabulary, some answer the questions, but it's been much more traditional um, rather than um, looking for their proficiency in the assessments. Absolutely. So the way that I handle it, and I'm not telling you that the way that I handle it, it's the correct way because it's what works for you, what your district demands of you. And, um, and it's going to be different. So I'll tell you this, I cannot really implement standard based grading in my in my case, because um, I am required, every teacher is required in my district, the entire district, that 60% of our grades are assessments and 40% of our grades are classwork. It's, it's, it's classwork. So I can't really change that. One year, I was a rebel. I, I, I was a rebel. And <laughs> my um, information spe specialist hated me. She came back and she said, you need to change all your grade book. I mean, and I had to go back and change all of that because it's like, you're not supposed to do that. So learn my lesson, right? And, and that's why my grading system is like 60% projects and, and, um, and tests and like 40% is classwork. Now I can play with that. I could make a test wait two times or I can, like my quiz, is, I put a 0.5 weight of that 60%. So I can play that way, but I don't have much, you know, much, much flexibility as far as that, because that's, you know, by my district. But the way that I build it, the way I build my assessing in my class is that, for example, I'm doing, if I am doing, uh, we're, we're exploring a story about, or let's just say that we are doing the first week of school that we just talked about, right? They learn about me and they learn about a few other classmates. So let's just say that the first two weeks, I have one short paragraph about me and five paragraphs about other students. 
So maybe a quiz for them is going to be multiple choice, but it's not going to be like, and, and it's going to be informative. Formative is Meredith White and I talk about how formative is her boyfriend, like because it saves so much grading time. And even though my school, some years they pay for it, I've been using it for three years now. If they don't pay for it, guess what? I'm paying for it. Even if it means getting in an argument with my husband about spending $150 on work. So, and on things that the school should pay for, but that's, it's just, to me, it's worth it so much. So if we have, um, every time we have, let's just say I have one paragraph about me, I can build maybe 15 questions and they could be some of the same questions I put on the Kahoot, but I could build questions like, which is not true about Profe Delgadillo. And I can give them four statements of like three that are not, that, three that are true and one that's not true. And then I could do other types of questions like, oh, for example, you know, what does she like to do or which of the following activities she doesn't like to do. So even though there are multiple choice questions at the beginning, these are um these are my formatives right at the beginning we're building that literacy because with input they have to have repeated input repeated structures and then like also they'll, i'll do the same for the paragraphs about the students about the special person interviews and then once i'm done with that unit if i want to do an assessment for that i could definitely have them write a paragraph like they're gonna have all the paragraphs that we wrote in the in a paper, and I maybe I can do a listening assessment where I'm making statements, and they have to write the name of the student who that statement refers to, or maybe I can make open-ended questions. But they have this is a listening, so they have the text in there of all the students, and then I can ask a question, and I can say, "What is it?" Uh, which students were born in October? And let's just say that of those five, two happened to be born in October. And, and then, you know, like, so that could be part of a listening test. And then part of the writing test, it could be, uh, I can give them some scaffold, uh, a scaffolding, like meaning like three or four phrases that are used to write comparisons. And, and maybe one their uh, short output test is gonna be, write a paragraph about how two students are similar and different. And then they'll be able to do that. But that would be, again, they have had the paragraph about me and maybe three to five other paragraphs. And we've been recycling those structures. So by this time, they're very familiar with them. But the activities in between can be, like you said, your multiple choice and you know all of that, if that makes sense. So that's, and, and so that's at the beginning of the school year. But like if you were working with um, a Spanish reader, you would do about the same thing. Like you, you could do your comprehension checks could be, and your quizzes could be geared towards um, listening and reading, heavy and listening and reading. And then you're, uh, you can give them a lot of opportunities to do um, writing in class with scaffolds during this time. And then towards the end, then you can have, your, your test could be speaking or writing. And it's like one prompt and the students can were able to do it or not. And if they were not able to do it, then that's when you have the tutorial. That's when you help them do it during a retake, if that makes sense. So that's kind of, that's how I handle it. Like most of my quizzes are interpretive listening and reading uh, or in class little projects where they're writing with support. And that way I can see how they're coming along. And then their finals, are speaking or writing but and, and that's what works for me and my grading system but there is no perfect way to do this and before I closed off because you mentioned standard-based grading one time a long time ago about during COVID actually I had um a session with uh, Megan Butkey about standards-based grading so if you're because I know some schools are pushing for that. And again, I'm not against it. It's just that my school personally has things the way they have them. Um, but if you're interested in that, I'll share that slide if I can find it, So the video. So yes. So I hope I have answered your questions. 
And if you use the hexagonal thinking activity, let me know how it goes. I, I know it's going to go great because, you know, I've tried it and I tested it. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Araceli. And I'm still looking through my video database here. Where can it go? Gracias, gracias, muchas gracias. Yeah, I will make sure to add all the links in there. I'm trying to find this video. But let me write a little note so I don't keep anybody on hold, but I will share it. I will share the uh, link with you, Amy, and everybody on the email that I'm going to send you and the attendees. And that one has a uh, standard base grade. Okay, so if you can, if you want to check it out, it's a great, great one. But thank you so much for spending time with me. We went over time, uh, but everybody stayed. So I'm so glad that this was helpful to you. Take much care and wish you the best on this back to school.